Kara Noble brings us a tweet from Neil deGrasse Tyson. A weight loss book written by physicists would be one sentence long. Consume calories at a lower rate than your body burns them. Superb ad brings us. Yes, these are plants. It's a picture of some lettuce and apple, carrots, and broccoli. And these are plants too. It's a picture of a chocolate bar, a bag of sugar, a bag of flour, and a bowl of rice with chopsticks. I guess technically chopsticks come from a plant. They continue on. There is no such thing as a plant hierarchy. Food is food is food. Diet culture loves to hijack eating by using fear-mongering and cherry-picking data to fit its narrative. MG replies, post sponsored by Nestle. Cheap and brittle brings us. Cake is healthy. If you had nothing to eat, cake would keep you alive. Yes, this is black and white, but so is saying cake is unhealthy, or sugar is toxic, or that being overweight leads to ill health. Smoshi replies, I mean, if you had nothing else to eat, cannibalism would be healthy too. But I don't recommend it. Shrug, shrug. Mean Fat Girl tweeted, Her YouTube channel is okay to be fat. Okay, so let me just clear up something for the thin people here. Because every time we talk about medical fat phobia, someone comes running in to claim that doctors have to know your weight to dose all meds. And yeah, that's not how it works for adults. Children are dosed by weight as a regular part of the medical process. Adults are not. Once you are over a certain weight, you just get the same pills everyone else does for most things. Even when doctors should be dosing by weight for adults, they haven't been. It was like 2012 or 2013 when the Cancer Doctor Association said that people should be dosed for chemotherapy by their actual weight, and not by what the medical field has decided they're supposed to weigh. And then they go off about how fatness is causing cancer deaths. Fat people are not included in medical drug trials unless the drug is for weight loss. So the idea that doctors have to have a weight on every patient for every medication so they can do careful math doses properly, that's a myth. If your doctor needs your weight for something specific, they could tell you that. But no, we're just supposed to put up with deadly, fatphobic medical discrimination because of a myth about something that is not happening. For flowers actual sake, y'all, I did not say that zero meds are dosed by weight for adults. You are asked for your weight every time you go to the doctor. You are not being dosed for weight-dependent meds every time you go to see a doctor. So why can't they ask for this information when needed? I don't discuss my sex life with my doctor unless it's necessary. And yeah, sometimes it is. And when it is, they ask. You don't have to fill out a sex survey every time you go to the doctor. Like, this is not that complicated. You know how I know it's true? I always refuse to weigh in, is how I know. And sometimes, they tell me they have to have it for something specific, then yeah, I do it. But 99% of the time, the nurse is like, yeah, whatever. Because they do not need that info at that time. I like how even in her own version of events, the nurse has attitude with her for being a pain in the butt. She continues, why are people so determined to be ignorant and loud and wrong about this? Like, I did not cause this situation. I'm merely looking to get actual health care. And when I give over my weight, I stop getting actual health care. So what am I supposed to do? You tell me since you all know everything. And believe it or not, she follows all of that rant up with, If you want to hang out with me, have a fun time and support my work, watch my streams, etc., etc. Tim Moses tweeted back to her, I think it's more about identifying a significant change. 20 pounds gained or lost without explanation can indicate bigger problems than obesity. For example, cancer, and I'm certain many other potential medical issues. This one's brought to us by Vintage Butterfly. I just had lunch and was considering having a cookie or three, and the thought occurred, what if other species didn't have a built-in nutrition storage system? Suppose their bodies have just so much of a reserve of energy and if they don't have food stockpiled when lean times arrive, well, then they discover Earth and the concept of fat. An automatic system that in times of plenty stockpiles fuel right inside the body, placing it in pre-designated locations. And not only is it a hedge against lean times, the fat provides padding, insulation, and it's a natural flotation aid. What miraculous stuff. What an ingenious system. What an elegant solution to the threat of starvation posed by the death world's 
constant environmental fluctuations. Death World? Is he playing a video game? Then the aliens learn about the Western world's obsessions and phobias and general social neuroses about fat. No matter how hard they try, they can't make sense of it. To them, the fat storage system is a miracle of biology. Yet another wonderfully bizarre attempt of life on Earth, which is a planet that seems to go out of its way to find creative ways to kill its inhabitants. Earth is home to the geology of mass destruction, the climates that want you dead, the diseases from hell, and all the murder beasts. Ah, he's writing about Australia. Yet instead of addressing any of these threats, humans decide to devote massive amounts of time, money, and the efforts of thousands of our brilliant, creative, fantastically adaptable minds to defeating one of our own survival mechanisms does not compute. Obatrol and Cocktails replied, Lol, elegant? It would take this alien life about 30 seconds to figure it out. That overuse of this onboard storage system makes the body less capable of performing essential functions. From Beyond But lately, something hasn't been sitting right with me and I'm trying to figure it out. I'm not saying you can't be healthy at any size. The evidence is pretty clear here, in spite of all those who are determined to disprove it. No, the issue I have is much more fundamental than that. I'm starting to wonder whether fat has absolutely anything to do with our health. Most of us know the history by now. The link between fat and health was created by greedy insurance companies. The myth that fat people were unhealthy was invented by racist religious white folk who were determined to find ways to continue to oppress black folk once they couldn't enslave them anymore. Yet scientists and healthcare professionals still allow ourselves to work within the confines of these racist, capitalist constructs that have such atrocious foundations. Brad Thanos replied, Jesus, just eat a calorie deficit, man. Bob the Orange Cat, Jesus didn't eat for 40 days. I'm pretty sure he was rocking a crazy huge calorie deficit. From Pandora Sus, originally posted in Me in Real Life. 1,600 calories, and they show some junk food. Also, 1,600 calories, a bunch of healthy food. Jade replies, Great, now do a price comparison. Keyboard Warrior replies, How can you put a price on diabetes? Erzad adds, It's about $1,200 for a 90-day supply. For the next few, trigger warning, Reagan Chastain. This one's brought to us by Ms. Beaver. Even a small amount of weight loss confers health benefits. Nope, that's diet culture talking. Someone makes behavior changes, they experience health changes, and simultaneously a small, usually temporary weight change. Our fat phobic culture incorrectly credits the weight change instead of the behavior change for the health changes. She continues, For starters, health is not an obligation, barometer of worthiness, or entirely within our control. It's also a very amorphous concept that is often vastly oversimplified in the service of healthist messages. With that said, I think it's important to deconstruct the idea that we hear that even a small amount of weight loss confers health benefits. That's beyond suspect. First of all, when you hear that the 5% weight loss has benefits, you should know that the 5% number actually comes from attrition and not research. They started with the very specific Metropolitan Insurance Height Weight Tables, but doctors don't get people to hit those weights. Then they went with 20% weight loss, but doctors couldn't get people to hit those weights, so they went to 10%, but, you guessed it, doctors couldn't get people to hit those weights, so now they're down to 5% and still falling. But the truth is that if someone changes their habits and they experience health changes, and a small amount of weight loss, it's ridiculous to credit the weight loss for the behavior changes, especially since weight loss, through things like liposuction, doesn't result in those same health changes, and the research shows health changes can happen without weight changes. So if someone tells you that even a small amount of weight loss will have health benefits, know that they're practicing weight stigma and not medicine. Snoo Foxes replies, And she just proves she doesn't know what she's talking about. The reason why a small amount of weight loss has benefits is because the body loses visceral fat first, and that's the most dangerous. The reason liposuction doesn't give health benefits is because liposuction targets subcutaneous fat. Elmir brings us your next dose of Reagan. But I physically feel better when I lose weight, so that's why I need to keep managing it. Let's take a closer look at this, shall we?
In yesterday's post, I talked about how feeling better after weight loss is not really due to weight loss itself, but rather to the emotional validation we receive from others and society at large. But what about when people say they truly feel better physically when they lose weight? Is it still the weight loss that is the root cause? Let's take a closer look. To begin with, there's no doubt that losing weight can be more physically comfortable. We may be able to bend easier. There may be less skin chafing, etc. So I'm not going to pretend that isn't the case. But the question remains, is weight loss then necessary to feel better physically? And is it the only way we can feel better? The answer to those questions is no. And here's why. We can feel better physically when we engage in a regular exercise routine that feels good, even if weight loss doesn't happen. Eating more nutritionally dense foods and in amounts that feels good to us helps us feel better physically even if weight loss doesn't happen. Pain may reduce with weight loss, but that only takes the pressure off. It doesn't cure the root cause of the pain. Working to treat an injury or physical imbalance can help us feel better, even if weight loss doesn't happen. When we live in a culture that vilifies fatness, we don't hear any positive attributes of living in a larger body. We don't get to hear how we can feel more grounded and stable, or stronger or softer. Shifting our beliefs about what fatness means can make us feel more physically comfortable in our bodies. So in the end, needing to lose weight in order to feel comfortable physically just isn't really true. But the reality is the pursuit of weight loss can end up damaging us physically, not to mention mentally and emotionally. When we take the focus off weight, we can put the focus on what will actually make us feel better. Aggravated Pineapple replied, What the duck? They have absolutely lost it. Beyond delusional. I'm actually genuinely mad at this one because I know how amazing weight loss feels, and they feel the need to keep people from that. And, hey, by the way, weight loss has solved much of my chronic pain. Still have fibromyalgia, but it's way better. Right Count replies, Yeah, but you still have fibro, so I guess the weight loss didn't help. Aggravated Pineapple. Oh, shoot. I'll go back to stuffing my face then, and make it all worse again. Well, I hope your Reagan vaccine is working, cuz here's another one. This one comes to us from Elmir2000. Sure, most diets fail. You just have to keep trying. Nope, that's diet culture talking, and if I listen, I'll spend my life yo-yo dieting, putting my goals, dreams, and life on hold, waiting for a thin body that never arrives. Hard pass. The word has certainly gotten out that dieting fails almost all of the time. Unfortunately, instead of moving to a health at every size platform, the responses to this are typically in one of the two categories. Category 1 is recommending more and more dangerous treatments, dangerous diet drugs, bolting the mouth shut, surgically mutilating the disease system, etc. Side note, the bolting the mouth shut thing is not true. The treatment that just came out, and I'm not even sure they're doing it on anyone yet, has to do with magnetically holding your mouth closed for a couple weeks and then being able to detach it. The idea of this is to help you get to a healthy weight rather quickly if you're having troubles with self-control. Personally, I think it sounds a lot safer than getting surgery, but let's continue. The other is to admit that it's almost certain to fail, but insist that we keep trying. This is ridiculous. Dieting fails about 95% of the time, and the odds don't go up on repeated attempts. It's like saying if you jumped off your garage wearing a cape as a kid and failed to fly, that just means you have to commit harder and keep trying. I was caught up in this myth for a while, but I realized that if I didn't let go of my dieting, I was looking at a life of yo-yo dieting, hating my body, and then dying as a fat person without ever having lived. Choosing math, logic, and myself over yet another weight loss attempt is one of the best decisions I've ever made, and it's a decision that I continue to make every day. Anduin is a zombie replies, That's a lot of words for, It's too hard, I give up. Running for health. Her example of the little kid wanting to fly is probably the reason we have planes, pilots, and space flights. It's really a bad post all around. And this one I found myself, not that it's hard to find. I'm fat, not a person with obesity. Like I'm short, not a person with under tallness. This push for person-first language for fat people is led by those who sell dangerous and expensive weight loss interventions and want to define existing in a fat body as a health condition to gain a market and insurance coverage for their unethical products. She continues, These person-first language snake oil salespeople often hide behind organizations that they've created to defraud us into believing that this is about being against weight stigma when, in fact, it's about eradicating fat people. Don't be fooled by this. Making fat the Voldemort of adjectives is not destigmatizing it, and you can't claim to be against weight stigma 
while trying to profit from a message that fat people should be eradicated and no more should ever exist. This may actually be one of the stupidest things I've ever read. Let me illustrate with an example. If I lose my leg in an accident, I don't want to be called a cripple. I want to be called a person who lost his leg or a person who was crippled. And if I get a robotic replacement for my leg, I don't want to be called cyborg. I want to be called a person with cyborg parts. Wait, I take that back. I do want to be called cyborg in that case, but I reserve the right to yell booyah at random intervals. This one comes from Ms. Beaver. It may or may not be Reagan. I suspect it is. Before and after photos aren't a form of motivation. They're a form of public shaming for anyone who identifies more with the before than the after. I'm working on a story about how and why before and after photos are so discriminatory, problematic, and pretty much always fat phobic. Registered dietitians, therapists, and other health experts, I'd like to get your take on these. And to everyone else who feels uneasy looking at a before and after photos, but isn't sure why, here's some things to think about. Before and after photos, which almost always show a fat body that becomes a thin body, blatantly imply that one type of body is better than the other. This is discriminatory against fat people. They're triggering for fat people because it's yet another example of their body being devalued and held up as an example of something that is wrong and in need of fixing. They're also triggering for anyone who struggles with body image and believes that they should be thinner, which is most people, even people in smaller bodies, because they confirm the false belief that thinner is always better. They celebrate weight loss and make it seem sustainable and realistic, which it is not. Many of the afterbodies will regain most or all of the lost weight eventually, or even more, and they'll feel awful because they were made to believe that they were more worthy in a thinner body. Dismantling diet culture and our obsession with thinness requires a ton of work, and it won't happen overnight, but for your part, you can stop posting and liking before and after photos. This isn't about physical change, it's about the mental before and after. Uh, then why is there a photo? Aggravated Pineapple replies again. On this episode of Attempts to Control Everyone and Everything to Make Everything Fit My Narrative. From Beth Lizard Breath. It's a picture of an old sailing vessel. Weight-centric medical care is fringe science. If your doctor brings up intentional weight loss, look them in the eye and ask if the sun revolves around the flat earth or if climate change is real. Laughing in their face is also a perfectly reasonable option. Kissian replied, Well, yeah, it's more or less fridge science insofar as patients wait, and therefore much of their health outcomes depend, directly or indirectly, on their diet and thus the contents of their fridge. Wait, you meant fringe science? No, honey, that's basically the opposite of what it actually is. Fall Leaves brings us. Pinterest just banned all weight loss advertisements. The platform will no longer feature any advertisements that discuss weight loss, reference BMI, or show before and after imagery. OCR Amazon replies, I, for one, am shocked that people still use Pinterest. This one comes from Real Account Name Here. Lose weight and other people's expectations and gain. A life full of dinners out with friends, family barbecues, date night dessert, popcorn at the movies, experiences. Lena Don't Love You replies, Experiences? Well, me and my friend and our kids walked almost 50 miles in three to four days hoofing it all over London. I would not have been able to do so when I was 300 plus pounds. I am Stephanie Michelle, posted on Instagram. What people think intuitive eating looks like at first. I'll stop tracking food and the binges will stop. I'll probably lose weight too. What intuitive eating actually looks like at first. I stopped tracking my food, but now I feel confused and tend to emotionally overeat. I'm actually gaining weight. There is more to this process than I thought. Can you relate? Intuitive eating sounds like a clear path to our goals. Give up dieting, attune to our body, live our best life. And it can look that way, but it's hard at first. When you give up dieting, it's liberating but confusing. You might feel out of control. You might be confused about what, when, and how to eat. Being intuitive is harder than wanting to be intuitive. If your journey feels messy, please understand that this is normal. Sometimes we need time, experimentation, and or support to navigate through the nuances. Here's a question to ask yourself. Do you want to eat intuitively so that you can have an easier relationship with food? Or is it another weight loss strategy? Because that's dieting under another name. If living intuitively is your goal, you can get there. 
The road may look different than you imagined, but it's a road worth traveling. Support is available. Support for what? You're just following your intuition. Ay ay ay. This one comes to us from Muster. How to spot a personal trainer stuck in diet culture, bar the obvious, and when to run for the hills. For complete transparency, I will hold my hands up and say in the past I myself used this type of language. I will help you make better decisions. Just make smarter choices. Be wise with your food choices. Sound familiar? So why is this language harmful? Look at the words used here. Better, wise, smart. In this context, they all apply to choosing lower calorie foods or healthified foods. This automatically makes us think that every other food choice is worse, foolish, and stupid. That higher calorie foods are inherently wrong or bad and to only be had in moderation. And whilst we're here, when you're applying moderation to food and it stems from fear, fear of fat, it's restriction. Restriction worsens your relationship with food. But here's the thing, food does not have a moral value. Choosing a lower calorie food is not better. Because funnily enough, food hasn't been put on this earth to be counted as calories. Food is more than calories. The lower the calories, the better it creates a superiority complex. It doesn't make you a better human by choosing lower calorie foods. It also leads us to believe that by making these decisions that we are in complete control of our weight and health, and that isn't true either. Boldy replies, This to me as a personal trainer just sounds like some poopy personal trainer who is now trying to get into the inclusive act. I regularly refer to healthy foods. They are not necessarily lower calorie foods, but they are healthier than other foods. It's a common mistake weight loss personal trainers make to think that healthy equals low calorie. A Mars bar is 200 calories, about, but a poopy food source. A homemade fresh curry is healthy eating. Healthy eating refers to more than just calories, if you're not an idiot. Not given an F cub brings us. Yes, many people are meant to be fatter than they allow themselves to be. Yes, many people are happier and healthier in fat bodies. Yes, many people find fatter bodies sexually desirable. The fact that any of this is surprising has everything to do with how and why fat phobia was produced. Kissian replies, Meant to be fatter than they allow themselves to be? Who says what they are meant to be? I thought we were supposed to listen to our bodies. If those bodies want to be thinner, why is that wrong? From Skate O'Clock. They've taken a message and edited it. It originally said, Exercise is a celebration of what your body can do, not a punishment for what you ate. And they changed it to, Exercise is an able-bodied celebration of what some able bodies can do, not a punishment for what you ate. Someone replies, Self-improvement is inherently right-wing. Which is kind of a dumb thing to say, but it gets worse. Your life is determined by your race, class, privilege, and systems completely out of your control. Self-improvement suggests agency and an ability to control success in life. It's also fatphobic and ableist. Random BR guy replies, Their heads would go boom the day they find out there's disabled athletes. There's even the Paralympics. Nobodyville adds, Wait until they hear about physical therapy. Imagine the horror of being made to walk exercise after an injury. If life throws an injury at you, you better just lay down and die, or you might be guilty of ableism. Eliza Tay brings us, Gyms are a scam. How you look is determined by your genetics and weight. Lifting weights like an ape just causes injuries and takes away time that could be spent on intellectual pursuits that benefit society. Gyms should be banned altogether from this country. Not only are they clearly unhygienic and spread viruses, but they've sucked money from low-income families and created waves of depression and body dysmorphia through distorting our perceptions of healthy and fit. I don't train at gyms and I guarantee I'm stronger, fitter, and smarter than any of those meatheads. Shh, our little secret replies. Either the OP is an idiot or a troll, or both. Fools always let you know when they are one. Also, I guarantee you exercise does help depression, for those of you lurking here, because working out eases symptoms of depression and anxiety. Not only that, but from personal experience, I have PTSD, anxiety, and depression. It's helped so much.
It and therapy has allowed me to go from taking a million tons of pills prescribed by my doctor to a limited amount, and now I don't have to worry about my kidneys giving out. Lisa Daisy brings us. Lies were taught by diet culture. Lies. We have complete control over our weight and the size of our body. Truth. Weight is controlled by genetics, environments, and several other factors. Lie. You will be healthier once you lose weight. Truth. Your weight does not determine your health. Lie. You will be happier and have a better body image once you lose weight. Truth. Dieting often makes our body image and relationship with food even worse. Lie. If you fail a diet, it's because you didn't have enough willpower. Truth. 95% of all diets fail due to biological and psychological factors. Cool Rob replies. You know, when I was in Anna treatment, I told my doctor that I was totally healthy despite my weight. She laughed, then threatened to have me tube fed. Your weight definitely has a connection to your health, even if it isn't totally visible right this second. Bad habits have a way of catching up to you at the worst possible moments. I can kind of agree on body image. It can totally be just a mental thing, but change can help. The way I see myself has definitely gotten a little better. Since I started brushing my teeth regularly and learned how to properly care for my hair, taking care of yourself, which includes proper foods, water, and exercise, does help. Just accepting that you hate yourself doesn't really do anything but bring you further down. From Artemis Meow, it's an infographic. On the left side, it says, Instead of a burger with no ketchup, no bun, eat half, I shouldn't want this so bad, eat light before. Try a burger with a flag on it. Freedom means honoring your needs without fear or guilt. Artemis Meow adds, with the American flag, too. <laughs> Don't call me Cecilia. Because America means love your body by stuffing it to bursting. From Lisa Daisy. It's another infographic. The BMI scale is not inclusive to all bodies. On the left, who the BMI scale is designed for. White European men in 1830. Who the BMI scale does not consider. Everyone else. BMI is BS. Urgh. BMI is racist. Urgh. The BMI is ancient history, as are many nutritional guidelines that exist in our world. Health is more than a number on the scale. According to some doctor or another, there is no evidence that routine screening of BMI does anything to improve health behaviors of higher body weight individuals. It persists even though it has no true value. Listless replies, Since when is the 19th century ancient history? BMI is old, therefore it is wrong. The heliocentric model is much older than BMI, so... And when they said, BMI screening in itself doesn't improve health behaviors, therefore it is wrong. As if the risk disappears if you don't measure it. I call it Schrodinger's disease. I can't be sick unless I'm diagnosed with something. From Mickey Blue Eyes. TLDR. Like, I was really mean to a fat stranger because she was bragging to me that she was on the list to get gastric bypass surgery. The details. Husband, daughter, and I are on a weekend vacation camping at Santa's Village, about to go on the tractor ride. Seats are not going to fit both me and my DH. So he and Dee Dee go on without me. A few people pass by, and then another fat mom sends her husband and two kids along and is waiting with... We watch other slimmer couples get on the ride with their families, and I say, It's so unfair, eh? They say, Two adults, but they don't make it so we can actually go. And it would be easy to just have one car that extra large, or even that would fit a wheelchair or scooter. We start talking, and she tells me she's excited to be on the wait list for gastric bypass surgery. I told her I had pretty strong feelings about this and asked if I could be blunt, and she said yes. Her points are this. She's been back and forth about it since 2007. She's researched it a lot. There are five doctors involved. She knows she's beautiful. It has nothing to do with how she looks. We would be getting ruiny, so this is better. I don't know what ruiny means. She wants to be able to play on the floor with her kids. She firmly believes fat is unhealthy, and she will die from fatness anyway if she doesn't get the surgery. My points. Fat has little to do with health. It's actually oppression that is unhealthy. Has she researched just the surgery or other options? Her response was, yes, I've researched other weight loss methods. To which I replied, no other ways of dealing with being fat, like HAES or IE acceptance. Not everyone is designed to be a marathon runner. Body diversity is real, and maybe she needs to accommodate her body more. 
get orthotics, use a cane, rest more. She looked horrified. I tried to change the subject when I realized she was not open to anything I had to say. When her family came back around and she took a pic of them, and this is the mean thing I did, this is where I went too far. I asked her if she wanted me to take a pic with her in it. She declined. I said, she should make sure she has some pictures with her in it, as I know some families where the mom has died from weight loss surgery and the orphan kids didn't have many pics with their mom because she didn't want to be in the pictures either. Black Katya replied, First of all, what an other slope. Also, fat has nothing to do with health. Doesn't really jive with get orthotics or use a cane. From Superb Ad It's not your fault that you still feel the desire to lose weight, even when you acknowledge diet culture is harmful, fat phobic, and racist. However, even though we all breathe in the diet culture air, you can create protection for yourself to be less impacted and advocate for bigger changes to improve the diet culture air. MG replies, Diet Culture Air, the new fragrance from Kelvin Klein. Brought to us by Vict. I can't be hungry. I only ate breakfast an hour ago. Reframe this as, I am having physical sensations of hunger in my body. My body is communicating with me, and I don't judge my body or second-guess it. There are a lot of reasons my body might require more food and energy right now. I will honor my body and my hunger. Vital Musician replied, Or, I mean... You could use your prefrontal cortex like an adult. I don't know. Wasteland Baby brings us. It makes me feel bitter whenever a non-fat person talks fondly about something that is inaccessible to fat people. It fills me with rage. I think the rage comes from knowing that they don't even realize that they're privileged for getting to enjoy those things. Fudging have some awareness. Incremental Detours replied. When my mom died, I'd go through periods of really resenting when other people talked about their moms. Like, I'll be fine with not having a mom, as long as nobody else gets to have a mom either. These were times when I wasn't coping well, and I never thought it was normal to think that way. There's just so much mental health wrapped up in obesity. From Love Dove Bunny Hi all, my five-year-old has started asking questions about whether foods are healthy or not and I'm not sure how to respond. He's asked about everything ranging from ice cream to celery, and I've just said yes each time, and then thought, I need to go ask the HAES group. They'll know a better response. (laughs) And I'm finally sitting down to do that. I just don't want him to start associating anything with being good or bad, etc., and internalizing any of that, especially at this age. He says he started learning about this at school, when they were learning about food groups. Thanks in advance. Seaboats replied, This is unfortunately how we end up with adults who have no idea that eating ice cream and fast food all day is unhealthy. From Beyond Che. Content warning, ED mention. I don't know who needs to hear this, but you're not going to recover from your ED unless you unlearn your fat phobia. It's very tiring to see skinny people think that having an ED means that you're absolved of fat phobia. Like, I'm sorry, babe, but not wanting to be fat to the point where you've developed an ED is fat phobia, and you're not going to recover unless you unlearn that. Illicit Lizard replied, Ah, yes. The problem with having an ED that results in fat phobia is totally the fat phobia and not the ED. Definitely way more dangerous. Rolling eyes. Therapy? Useless. Just unlearn your obvious fat phobia. Duh. From Lisa Daisy. It's a list of six studies. You know what? This might be another Reagan Chastain one, so... Take your vitamins, hold on to your hats and lunches, here goes. Whenever anyone brings up the fact that intentional weight loss attempts fail the vast majority of the time, yes, even if you call them lifestyle changes... Someone tries to claim that it's only based on one study in the 50s. That's a lie spread, unsurprisingly, by people who profit from weight loss and fat phobic trolls. In truth, there isn't a single study where intentional weight loss attempts result in significant, long-term weight loss for more than a tiny fraction of the participants. It's not just Stunkard. That's the name of the author of the 1959 study. The truth is that, by far the most common outcome of weight loss attempts, Yes, even if you call them lifestyle changes, is short-term weight loss, followed by weight regain within two to five years, 
which means that prescribing weight loss is not remotely an ethical or evidence-based practice. Hagelpoise replied, I'm too lazy to look up the other studies, but I'm guessing it'll be the same general idea. The 20 Canadian Expert Panel on Obesity didn't determine that weight loss doesn't work. They determined that the things Canada had been doing to treat obesity hadn't been working, mostly because they were hard to access, and recommended there be more targeted obesity treatments made available through Health Canada. Seriously, the paper starts by listing a whole range of diseases obesity causes, including multiple types of cancer, and then end by saying there needs to be better medical nutritional advice and psychological therapy for obesity. Lisa Daisy adds, I looked them up, and that's pretty much what each says. The Australian one uses BMI and waist circumference to diagnose on-site, and goes on to explain how physicians can treat obesity. Edit, Man Tomiyana states one-third of people regain weight, but acknowledge that's because people go back to old habits. They say treatments need to improve and more help is needed. W.C. Miller looked at the Stunkard study and summarized that people gain weight back, then goes on to say that doesn't mean they shouldn't try, but there's no one answer. The NIH study says that high weight is unhealthy, and what was currently being done wasn't working. Cherry-picking data at its finest. From Crazy Khajiit Lady Posted in a PCOS support group, a condition known to be correlated with insulin resistance and diabetes, among other symptoms. Advocating intuitive eating for a condition documented to worsen with weight gain is both infuriating and reckless. Alright, here's the post. Someone asks, Is it possible to do intuitive eating with PCOS? My therapist recommended it because I binge eat too. I've researched and tried to put it into practice. I gained 20 pounds trying to implement this lifestyle. I know you're supposed to be in tune with your body to know when you're full and to stop. A lot of the time I didn't stop and I overate. I'm getting the concept, but wondering if there's a better way to do it. Should I meal plan or etc.? Anybody been successful with intuitive eating with PCOS? Someone replies, At the beginning of intuitive eating, you usually consume a lot because you've been restricting your body for so long, it eventually levels off. I've been in recovery for a year and a half now. Any type of restriction is going to cause eventual binging because you're not eating enough. Intuitive eating was what helped me recover. And yes, I gained weight, but I needed to. If you're struggling with an eating disorder, any type of diet, calorie deficit, carb cutting, meal planning, or meal portioning is going to end in a binge. I would recommend an intuitive eating dietitian or a PCOS dietitian that is HAES, health at every size, and non-diet centered. There are a ton on Instagram. That's where I found my dietitian. Oh, God, that's got to be the worst place to find a dietitian outside of TikTok. Captain Trips replies, Yawah! Intuitive eating with PCOS is how I gained 24 kilos in six months. That's about 50 pounds. And absolutely ruined my health and made my PCOS way worse. I had no off switch with my appetite when I was insulin resistant. Made worse, of course, because I wasn't restricting simple carbs anymore which just makes insulin resistance worse when eaten in abundance, which makes appetite worse. I wouldn't recommend intuitive eating to anyone already overweight or with insulin issues. Patagonian pour-over brings us. I'm pretty sure we've seen this one before, but I thought the replies were pretty funny. If someone has issues managing their finances, no one mocks that person for setting a budget and monitoring their spending. No one says, just spend in a way that feels natural. Intuit what it feels like you need to spend. If you get into debt, even serious debt, lesson learned, and you can work your way back out. But that's often the message given to people struggling with food intake habits by those promoting intuitive eating. Sometimes we need guidance and structure. Brett Thanos replies, My financial set point is really low, into the negative even. Tsukinan adds, I've gone no spend so many times that everything I buy automatically costs five times what it costs everyone else. From Olivia Olive. I lost 100 pounds through starvation keto diet, literally 400 calories a day, and gained 170 after I began to eat healthily. And it's because you can't live off 400 calories forever. Diets don't work, and anyone who says it's a motivational issue can kiss my fat bum. Thanks for the excellent post. Smile and hearts. Ed Straight Vibin replies, I did keto. I lost almost 50% of my body weight. Want to know what I gained? an understanding of how food affects my brain and body. Keto for me wasn't so much a vessel for weight loss 
as it was a means to change how I view food permanently. If you're on 400 calories a day, you're doing keto wrong. Cat Poot in My Shoe brings us a post from an Instagram model who happens to be fat. Eating disorders, weight stigma, food accessibility, and fatness are very convoluted existences. They need comprehensive dialogue and understanding. So when I see a post that creates a very linear perception of fatness, attaches value to food, and also projects personal bias as a fact, it will certainly rub me the wrong way. When you talk about fatness, and you purposefully ignore socioeconomic influences, culture, racism, mental health, and bias, you are doing it wrong. When you talk about food as an addiction, you are feeding into a capitalist stance to keep you in a shame cycle to constantly blame yourself as the issue, or that food is the issue. We need to stop assigning values to food. It is food and fuel for your body, just like water and shelter. As someone who is fat, that has an eating disorder, which is not binge eating disorder, nor has it ever been. I have felt completely ignored in my anorexia existing in a fat body. I starved myself to be thin as a direct result of fat phobic society. I still never became thin at 600 calories of healthy food. This ideology that fat people only exist because they eat unhealthy food is BS. Fat people exist in all cultures and all places, eating a variety of foods. What is bad for you is not inherently bad for someone else. We all deserve the right to choose, and we deserve full body autonomy to put into our bodies what it needs to survive and thrive. So here's me eating a banana. It's not good. It's not bad. It's simply a banana. Do what is right for you, and fuel your body with what it needs. Mel Arsa replies, Why do they always lie so unconvincingly? Is it because they have literally no idea what numbers are even believable? Because it's always... I only ate 400 calories a day and worked out harder than an Olympic hopeful three hours a day and can run a two-minute mile six times a day and I gained 100 pounds. And it actually makes me angry that they think anyone's stupid enough to believe them. But not as angry as the people who actually are stupid enough to believe them or worse. Corroborate the claims with their own BS stories of deadlifting 1,000 pounds on 800 calories a day and yet miraculously gaining fat only. Lisa Daisy brings us that essay was about scientific research findings that people with so-called normal weight BMIs do not live longer than folks with higher BMIs. But I've also been thinking about this fact in conjunction with my recent interview with Blank about thin privilege and all the ways we seek it out and shore it up, even when that causes harm to folks around us. Because when we note our thin privilege, but also share a post about feeling brave enough to wear a bikini, we are still reinforcing the idea that only thin bodies should wear swimsuits. They go on and on for a bit. Finally ending up with, because privilege is a messed up social construct, skinny people die too. Random BR guy replies, it's cringeworthy to see HAES activists claiming others are privileged. Like, dude, having access to the internet and being able to post whatever you want on it by itself is already a privilege. But I prefer Lottie ads, not to mention the inherent privilege of having a steady enough stream of food and income that you were able to eat yourself into obesity in the first place. And yes, I know they love to bring up food deserts, but I never get the impression that the people who write these screeds live anywhere near one, considering that not being able to find cute five extra large crop tops seems to be their main complaint in life. And why is it always crop tops? I wear size four and never felt the need to add one to my rotation. But they act like crop tops in public are a fundamental human right that fat phobia denies them. From Boros Dugo. The amount of calories your body burns changes daily. There's no way to know for sure how many calories your body is going to burn in any given day, or even to know an average of how many calories your body burns. Because, well, yeah, I've seen all those fancy little calorie calculators online. There's a lot more that goes into it than simply your height, weight, gender, and age. Next, even if you could have an idea of how many calories your body is burning, you can't know for sure how many calories are contained in the foods that you're eating. Food manufacturers are allowed to have a margin of error of up to 20% when it comes to labeling calorie counts on packages. Also, you know how calorie counts are decided for food? It's literally based on how long it takes the food to burn to ash. So, unless you have a literal Bunsen burner in your stomach, how accurate can that be? Once again, your best bet is to begin to learn how to listen to your body more, get more in tune with your body's internal cues, and start to honor your hunger without judgment. If you're struggling to quit dieting, 
Make sure to grab your free copy of my ebook, where I share my five steps to end dieting for good. Link in bio. Hegelpoise replies, Estimates are estimates. So why bother using them? What a tautology. Estimates are used in billions of different applications, from baking to your car's speedometer, to managing the train network and cash supply for an entire country. If they're reasonable estimates based on quality evidence, like for example a recognized TDEE formula and calorie database, go ahead and keep using them. Intuitive eating is basically just estimating anyway, but in a far less structured manner than TDEE slash calories in, calories out. From Strawmenopile. Yes, all the comments said that she's in starvation mode and needs to eat more. I was really excited to meet up with my fertility specialist today. To sum it up, I'm fat, which is why I can't get pregnant, and I'm fat, which is why I had a miscarriage. I told her that I'm vegan, and I do OMAD, where I literally only eat once a day. When I'm fasting, I drink only water. And for the first 30 minutes of my meal window, I eat only fruits and veggies to fill up. And then some kind of protein. Doing this, I've actually gained a few pounds. I gave her an example of yesterday. In 23 hours, the only thing I ate was three peaches, pinto beans, a tortilla, lettuce, tomato, a vegan yogurt, and an icy pop for dessert. She writes desert. She said, well, eating the tortilla was probably a problem. You just need to watch what you're eating and try harder and you'll lose. What? I literally told you I'm eating 1,200 calories and drinking water and exercising and still gaining weight and yet it's because I'm not trying? Her lies so bad that the foods she lists don't add up to 1,200 calories. Apprehensive Mud replies, I had a patient who swore up and down she only ate a single piece of toast every three days. She was super morbidly obese and near bedridden. She didn't count the bags of snack cakes surrounding her. Those were medicine for her self-diagnosed low blood sugars. And now Dechonkers from Webigail. It's a gray cat with black stripes. Need a dry food recommendation for pancake. From D3 Smar, it's an orange cat with stripes. In the first picture, he's standing on a desk. In the second one, he's standing by a window. Seven months later. In both pictures, he looks pretty skinny. From Sashby. It's a pale orange cat with stripes. In the first picture, he's hanging on for dear life. In the second picture, he's hanging out by a window by a friend. I'm so proud right now. We were having issues helping Jackhammer lose weight. He actually gained after being placed on a diet. Today, we found out he lost a pound. Go, Bubba. Go, Bubba. Mutron brings us some pictures of her gray cat, who has a few white patches, and green eyes. Lula became her best self in quarantine. From the pictures, it looks like she may have lost a couple of pounds. From Too Much Fur, it's a black, sleek dog. Seven-year-old Chonky Foster Fail. Chonka Chonka Burnin' Love. From G. Derma, it's a black cat, and the first picture it says below it, Big Obi Chungus last year. He calls him Chungus, but he doesn't look that big. In the second picture, he looks a little bit skinnier, more like a kitten. Now he's doing well at 17 pounds. He's a big cat anyway. 21 pounds to 17 pounds. Obi feels better. From Vegan J, it's a picture of a gray cat that's gone from 17 pounds to 13. Shiitake is down four pounds as of today. And so another video comes to an end. Special thanks to Hannah McNally, Carl Williams, and Daniel Korov for their support. I hope everybody enjoyed the video, and I'll talk at you guys again in a little while.